being here and supporting us. But both of them. So now we would like to introduce our panel of local artists and organizations. Just quickly, if the panel can raise their hand as we introduce you. So first, we have Travis Becker, director. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, so uh, we were asked to put together a list of uh, three to five tips uh, that we had for teens and youth. Um, but I always uh, want to just sort of acknowledge and say that I always feel funny as an older person coming in and giving youth advice because when I look back on the history of uh, traditionally marginalized folks, youth always lead the movement, so I kind of feel like we should be listening to all of you. So I feel weird being up here uh, in, a, in a space to give advice, but um, I am I'm excited to be here. Um, and speaking of youth leading movements, how many folks in this room by show of hands have heard the name Sylvia Rivera before? Just by show of hands. Got a few folks, okay. How about Marsha P. Johnson? How many folks have heard that name before? Okay, so for those who didn't raise your hand, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson were uh, two trans women of color who um, are credited with uh, basically starting the Stonewall Riots in 1969 in New York City, which is um, by many considered to be sort of the start of the um, queer uh, and trans and civil rights movement, right? And what I like to point out that I think a lot of people don't know about Sylvia Rivera and Marsha, Marsha P. Johnson. Sylvia, Sylvia Rivera was an 18-year-old Puerto Rican and Venezuelan trans woman, 18 years old, the night of the Stonewall Riots, right? So this was a time when it was illegal to serve queer and trans people drinks in bars. It was illegal. You couldn't, you couldn't serve them. So imagine being 18 years old and you're starting a movement, right? And Marsha P. Johnson um, was, a was a black trans woman and she was 24. So when, when you may feel as a youth that you don't have a lot of power and that you don't have a lot of ability to move things, uh, I, I hope that you can sort of challenge yourself to reflect on the fact that youth have always been at the front of our movements um, and they're always sort of holding it down. So, um, so my five tips. Uh, one, unlearning is just as important as learning. So we all know that we grow up through a system um, and uh, we are taught various things. I can remember being in first grade and people telling me that Pilgrims and Native Americans sat down and had like a really nice meal together, right? That's what we're told in like elementary school. And then you get to like middle school and they're like, well, it's a little bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. High school maybe, and then you get to college and then and if, if you make it to college, if you have access to make it to college even, you find, you find out that's all just this big lie, right? And that it didn't go down like that at all. Um, and so I think that one of my messages to folks is that unlearning could be just as hard as learning, right? Because you have to unlearn some stuff that was embedded in you for a really long time, right? So a lot of the folks in trans communities right now, breaking down this gender barrier of just man and woman, right? The idea that there's just two genders, we know that it's much more expansive than that. But that takes some unlearning for folks who grew up in a society that taught us that there's only two genders, right? So unlearning is just as hard as learning. Two, self-love, self-respect, and understanding oneself comes first before you can do anything else for others. And this is a lifelong process, right? So I want to reiterate that to folks. And um, I, I don't know, RuPaul says it better than I can. If you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you going to love somebody else? Right? So um, the world doesn't, doesn't always teach us to love ourselves, right? So there's some unlearning even in that process, I think. Um, but yeah. Three, do not dispose of those in your own community. Nobody is perfect, all right? So I'm not going to tell you what to go do with people in other people's communities, um, you know, because I think we can engage with each other in different ways across identity. But for folks within your own community, right, elders and others, people make mistakes. People don't always use the right words. People don't always say the right things. It's okay to get angry. It's okay to get frustrated. It's okay to say, I'm going to take a break. I'm not going to mess with you for a minute. But if it's someone from within your own community, right, you got to come from a place of love and eventually let that person back in, right? So I know that calling people out is really big right now, and I agree with a lot of people that need to get called out. 
Um, I also like to play with the idea too of calling in versus calling out, right? So calling in being something that you do as you call someone, uh, call someone in, in, in a way that is done with a little bit more love, right? But I also don't really believe in that binary of just calling in, calling out. I think it's all sorts of complicated. You can do all sorts of different various ways of that. But with folks in your own communities, right, especially um, in communities that are historically marginalized, communities that don't get taken care of, we can't really afford to be disposing of each other like that, right? And that's kind of reinforcing the prison industrial sort of cycle on each other, right? You did something wrong, I'm gonna throw you away forever because you're not worth anything. I don't believe in that. So my advice would be within your own communities, uh, don't dispose of each other. Uh, four, the platinum rule versus the golden rule, right? How many people have heard the golden rule? Which is treat others how you would want to be treated. Okay, cool, that, that, that works, right? Um, but I like the platinum rule, which is treat others how they want to be treated, right? <laughs> treat others how they want to be treated because how I want to be treated may be different than how Uncle Bobby wants to be treated, right? And both of those things are true and should be honored. Um, and I think that that's something that um, I would like folks to take away from today, uh, is treat others how they want to be treated. And so that applies, a very simple basic example of that is if someone tells you my pronouns are she, her, hers, not he, him, his, use she, her, hers pronouns. Because that is that person's pronouns, that is that person's truth, right? So treat others how they want to be treated. And um, my last tip um, is show up, show up. Um, there's been a lot of opportunities that have come my way simply by showing up. Um, and a lot of times that when I'm tired or when folks in the community are tired and I don't always have words to say things, I don't always have the ability to do great things, but I can show up and be somewhere, right? Um, I can show up for a friend. I can, I can uh, take a friend on a ride to a hospital or take a friend uh, to go pick up their meds somewhere. I can, I can show up in some kind of way. So find a way that you can show up and show up. Uh, don't not show up for your folks. Uh, but yeah, um, so those are the five things that I wrote down uh, in terms of my tips. But again, uh, my message that I would want, especially all the youth to walk away with today is that you are incredibly powerful um, and this world is not perfect. <laughs> and uh, you should believe in your own magic for sure. Because um, y'all are magical. So uh, thank you so much for having me. Next, we have Uncle Bobby, founder of the Love Not Blood campaign. Love Not Blood campaign works with families that have suffered the traumatic experience of homicide, whether by police officers, security officers, or community violence. The LNBC creates a family crisis team to build a broad-based network of healthy homicide family support. Our support groups for the parents, children, families, and friends, and community members affected by the traumatic experience of homicide bring about an atmosphere of social justice throughout the United States and internationally. The Love Not Blood campaign envisions a world where no one has the right to take the life of another and be protected, insulated from the consequences of doing so, by a system of structural racism, obfuscation, and propaganda. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you all who have come to spend this uh, this time with us. You know, it's really, really appreciated. So I am affectionately known to the community as Uncle Bobby. How many of you heard of Oscar Grant? Raise your hand. Okay, pretty much all. How many of you have actually seen the movie Fruit Bell Station? Okay, not all of you. So um, the tips that I'm going to share with you has a lot to do with what happened with my nephew on the Fruit Bell Bark platform on January 1st, 2009. So just really quick, just so that you know, uh, he was murdered by Officer Johannes Mesley. But because of the community embracing us, standing with us, crying with us, well back and forth the court with us, but most importantly, utilizing their First Amendment right to speak to that very injustice, for the first time in California state history, an officer was arrested, charged, convicted, and sent to jail. First time in California state history. That's significant. But how did that come about? So for those who have not seen the movie and for those that don't know, you can just Google Oscar Grant name and see that there was a video recording that took place that brought about this essence of what that police murder looked like. And so it becomes critical that I, everywhere I go, share with you the importance of your cell phone. And if you happen to have a camera or a video recorder, how important it can become a tool to help a family that has suffered the wrongs of the pain of a bad police officer. So my tips for you today is first, that app that's behind us, 
you can actually go to your Google Store or your Apple App Store and download it because you gotta have a walking law library in your hand and it will actually help you understand your rights if you encounter this situation of dealing with the police. So really take note of that. But this is what I'm gonna share with you. So when witnessing an interaction with a law enforcement officer, you have the right to film, photograph, record law enforcement officers while they're engaged in their law enforcement activity. You have that right. Remain at a safe distance from any law enforcement encounter you are documenting so that you do not physically interfere with the activity. That's important. Make sure you're not violating any laws while filming such as jaywalking or even trespassing. Tip number two, if you have been stopped, questioned, or searched by a law enforcement officer, this is what you need to know. Remember, anything you say or do can be used against you. Think carefully about your word, movement, body language, and emotion. Don't get into an argument with the officer. Extremely important. Stay safe. Don't do anything the officer might perceive as a physical threat or reaching for a weapon. Keep your hands where the officer can see them. Never physically resist or touch an officer, even if you believe they are acting unlawful. Never run from an officer. Four, assert your rights. Do not consent to any searches of, a per of your person or property. If an officer search your person or property without consent, say clearly that you do not consent to the search, but never physically resist or pull away. If you want to leave, ask if you're free to leave. If the officer does not answer, ask again. Tip number five, if you are arrested, ask for an attorney immediately upon your arrest and ask again if the officer reads you your rights or start to question you. Make sure that you tell the officer clearly that you want to speak with an attorney and not with them. Don't make any statement regarding the incident without an attorney present. Avoid making statements about your arrest or ticket to a friend or a family or on the internet, such as email, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Number six, tip number six, file a complaint. Don't tell the officer on the scene that you're going to file a complaint. <coughs> file a complaint later. Write down everything you remember ASAP. Remember the officer badge and patrol car number. Try to find a witness and their names and phone numbers. And if you are injured, take photographs of the injury as soon as possible. But make sure you seek medical attention. These tips can possibly save your life. Because as we see across this country today, and this is not an indictment to all police officers, but there are some bad police officers. We have to be clear about that. But what becomes real important is that you understand your rights so that you can survive that stop and then later file your complaint. That complaint is critical because that helps us identify those officers in our community that have a history of abuse. Without that complaint being filed, that officer goes unnoticed and as we know can result in another young person being murdered by that same officer had you have filed a complaint. We are our brother's keeper. And in order for us to really solve this problem, this divide that we have, we must become our brother's keeper. Your video can actually help a family identify what happened to their child and give them the hopes that they can get justice, especially if we know what happened to that child was wrong. So we as a family, Oscar Grant family, myself as an uncle, say thank you to all of you who took a moment out of your life when you saw what was happening on that platform to Oscar Grant and pull out your camera and video record and then upload it to YouTube begin to call our attorney at that time and even reach to search for us so that we can actually have that video to witness, sadly, but to witness what happened to my nephew. And it was because of that video, the only reason 
the real only reason why we were able to get the door cracked, we don't call it a victory, but we do call it historical. Because a victory is when we actually have stopped the murder of young people in this world. So it's my hope that these tips can help open the door for you to understand your rights, to download this application, and to share with your friends, because that tool in your hand can save someone's life. Thank you. Travis Baker, um, these messages and these tips are so wonderful and important to take into our communities and to, you know, unite and support teens as we work together to make sure that we can have victories in this world. Thank you. So next we have Poder Arcef. Poder's uh, mission is to create, is to organize with Latino immigrant families and youth to put into practice people-powered solutions that are locally based, community-led, and environmentally just. They nurture everyday people's leadership regenerate culture, and build community power. Poder organizes in San Francisco's Mission, Excelsior, and other Southeast neighborhoods, and forges alliances to achieve transformational change. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Wait, what is that? why am I standing up? <laughs> I thought I was about to give a speech. Um, <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Inksa. Uh, I am 16 years old. I think I'm the only teenager here on this panel. But it's okay, represent. Um, first of all, I would just like to take the time to really quickly um, acknowledge and um, recognize that we are on indigenous land right now. Um, me and Jackie's uh, topics, the topics we were assigned were uh, environment and immigration and how we can um, really relate those and bring them together because uh, you cannot talk about one without the other, truly. Um, and really just honoring our ancestors and the fact that we are on an indigenous land right now. I, I myself am from, um, not an indigenous tribe of North America, but from uh, Mexico and South America, I'm Zapotec and uh, Inca. And um, really just, giving thanks for the space that we've created all together. Um, we're really, really thankful um, for you guys, for you guys being here, all the youth. This is really something that's amazing for us. It really empowers us as youth, um, as a young person myself. Um, I'm really thankful for you guys being here, for your presence, for your energy. Uh, I believe that also all the, all the youth in here are also really thankful for all of you guys. Um, so our first, um, my, my first topic, I guess, was honoring the earth and our ancestors. And uh, I already said that, I already talked about that. The recognizing that we are on indigenous land and that um, borders are imaginary, that they are only social constructs, um, only things that have been created to separate people, like throughout history. Um, and that we do not own the land, the land owns us. We really, um, native peoples of around the world have like cultivated and lived on land for thousands of years, and it's it's beautiful to see how how much change has come about this same land, but always remembering that it did belong to somebody else before us. Um, what else? Food is cultura. Food is culture, and. Um, decolonizing your diet. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> decolonizing your diet means really starting to think about the ways in which we are oppressed in this country as people of color. Um, a big part of our oppression comes from food. And food always has always come from our environment. It, is, it was always cultivated and nurtured and it was always fresh and and so really trying to revert back to that. A lot of, like, nowadays we have a lot of, um, you know, all this genetically modified food, and it does not do good to our bodies. It does not nurture us the same way that, say, food that was grown in our homes did. So really um, 
learning about plants and crops that are ancestral to you, um, growing your own food and medicine, and respecting those who grow and harvest your food, um, and also action steps like really shopping at local markets to reduce your carbon footprint and supporting your local economy. So, yeah. You pass the mic over to I'm gonna pass the mic over to my to my friend Jacqueline Gutierrez. <laughs> Thank you, Isa. And it is very powerful that I get to share the space with Isa. Isa is one of the youth in the Bodea Common Roots Youth Program, so it's awesome that we get to share the space with all the panelists. Um, but we haven't done this together, so this is really fun. I'm really proud. Um, but touching on Inksa's points, right? Um, really acknowledging the ways in which we're living in now, connecting this to like our environment. Our environment is really everything that we see, that we breathe, that we live, that we communicate with, whether that's like human, non-human, plant, or whatever, right? Um, so really trying to connect ourselves with, with that aspect, right? And with that, we, we kind of, you know, we're coming, we're both from San Francisco, born, a few of us, you know, are left in the city and we're kind of really, really um, feeling those impacts. And I want to reference this uh, art that was made by Julio Salgado a couple years ago uh, with a collaboration for, for Poder. And I just feel like it's so representative of some of the stuff that we're battle that we're as young people, as families in San Francisco are up against. Um, you know, how how is affordable housing part of our environment, right? Often when we think of like environment, we think of like protect the forest and save the trees, which yes, we should do, but also acknowledge as urban folks, like we we know a different situation as urban folks with maybe less resources. Lower incomes, our, our, our definition of environment looks different, right? Feels different. Um, so really acknowledging that for us, environment has to be healthy, right? Um, I like to define environment as like place you play, live, go to school, work, um, where you're raising your family, where you're meeting your friends. So how, how is housing, you know, um, how are we being disadvantaged by all these evictions, right? In San Francisco, we have seen the eviction mass evictions, which you can literally call a cultural deportation of, of people um, intensely, right? The, you, the friends that I grew up with are far away now, right? Um, the black percentage of folks in San Francisco is about 2-3%. Um, and even in these communities that are historically communities of color, uh, let's say the, the Bayview, um, that was a naval shipyard, continues to be, you know, it's called called the shipyards. That was actually one of the first places that they tested the A-bomb before it was uh, sent overseas. So acknowledging that that history and that trauma exists within our land and folks are living, you know, where the projects are built out there. So really recognizing how city policy and city government has historically purposefully kind of put people in certain situations so that we're not healthy, so that our relationships to each other are not healthy, right? But um, last night actually during program, we were we were talking about um, uh, existence as resistance, and I was like, well, how do we get beyond existing? Because we want to be thriving. And it's the, the strength of our communities and acknowledging uh, the strength of our earth as well as um, that connection that, that's going to get us to that thriving point. Um, yeah, but I just, yeah, I do want to acknowledge that, that artwork, I love it. I just feel like it's really a representative of so many of the battles that we have uh, coming. But another another action step I wanted to share. Um, um, we do have uh, this really, really, really awesome um, community-led, uh, we call, it's a collective, we call VCs del Pueblo, which means Sites to the People. And it's um, when talking about environment, yes, we also have to talk about fossil fuels and like uh, corporations that you know purposefully destroy Earth and for profit. Um, but we have this collective that was totally created out of like community power, um, title power, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but the species of Pueblo program, the reason I love it, and it got me back on my bike. I am terrified of getting on a bike in the city, uh, but it. <laughs> It got me back on my bike, and I think it was that, that sense of community that like really made me more confident, not totally confident yet, uh, but getting there. Uh, but the reason I want to bring that up is because um, I just feel like it's a really powerful way to reclaim economy. I didn't get my bike through paying for it. I earned it, and by earning it, I mean like I learned the 
tricks of how to change a wheel and like certain things, right? That's how I actually earned a bike. And a lot of the youth that are in that program as well are getting free bikes through that, through learning that, that process of the mobility freedom, right? We call that bike equity. All the bikes that we receive and um, are able to distribute are bikes that uh, police have collected and are keeping in storage for like years. So why, uh, maybe a few years ago in San Francisco through organizing, uh, community powered organizing, uh, there was a policy that was passed so that these bikes had to be delivered or put back into community hands. So through through programs like DCs of Pueblo, Bikes to the People, we're able to like make sure that those assets that belong to community are actually being distributed in a you know cool, really cool way. Um, and another another thing I wanted to share that's also really exciting. Um, I'm really really passionate about plants and, and earth and growing our own food. Um, by the end of this year, so in a few months, <laughs> uh, it's been a long process of maybe five, six, seven years, uh, we're gonna be starting a community farm in the Excelsior. And this is gonna be a five acre farm, which like, where do you get five acres wow. in San Francisco, right? Um, it's there, right? One of the campaigns that we have is called Pueblote, which, is, um, which means pueblo, like town, place, your, your home. And lote, which is really taking the word of lot, and all these empty lots that we see in San Francisco. Adjacent to the parking lot at um, Cracker Amazon, right by the soccer field, there was this empty lot that for years and years was like dump site space, right? Empty space. Um, and some youth were like, hey, that's empty. What can we do with all this land? What can we do? So uh, in the next uh, couple months, this farm is going to be finally opening through big 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 process so i'm really excited about that but that's gonna that's gonna be a part of everyone's backyard right um whether you're living in san francisco or not do consider that your home and and what what you can give and take to that right um one thing i always like to remind myself is that um pretty much what Inso said um the the land is not ours we belong to the land so every every step that we take and every movement that we do always recognizing like how is it going to affect my entire environment so um i did um, want to share this one number as well when talking about immigration sorry i get so passionate but when i talk about land um but you know let, because we are folks of the land um recognizing that migration is something migration does not how do i put this Borders are imaginary, so it's hard to say that folks of one continent are migrating within their own space, right? And then when we think about um, immigrant communities in San Francisco who are being displaced out of San Francisco, that's like double, triple forced migration. So putting it that, putting that in that context is just mind blowing, right? And traumatic, but also seeing the resistance that comes out of that is really powerful. Um, one of the uh, organized efforts that's been going on is through a network called SF Island, San Francisco Immigrant Legal um, Network, and they created a uh, what I guess could be called a hotline, and that's the phone number up there. It's accessible in four different languages, and it operates 24-7, and that line is actually um, meant for if folks are experiencing um, some situation with ICE, this would be a hotline to call. Um, they can do raid verification and they would be able to um, legally assist any victims with um, legal aid and lawyers. So um, I would recommend writing this number down um, for future incidents if something happens. Thank you so much, um, Poder, and I will definitely be visiting that farm, you know, bringing some seeds, taking some food. So, um, next we will have uh, CC Caprio. CC Caprio uses acrylic, ink, aerosol, and installations. CC tells stories of immigration, ancestry, resistance, and resilience. She documents evolving tra traditions through combining folklore forms, bold portraits, and natural elements with urban art techniques. Her work is influenced by people and places she has been. CC paints everyday people who have been invisible in order to share their thriving presence and to show the dignity and power of their existence. So let's welcome CC. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for having us here and thank you for all the panelists. 
that are here, I'm very honored. Um, and Uncle Bobby, I just wanted to recognize that we unveiled the mural last night um, at a French restaurant at Fruitvale, and we painted off their grants alongside with um, with Mio D. She just recognized where we're at, where we're from. Um, and I say we because I'm part of an artist collective um, called Trust Your Struggle. And we are also the same collective that painted Oscar Grant's um, based on downtown Oakland during the time of the court, and I believe you can see that in the movie as well. Yeah. So, um, so thank you for being here with us, and thank you for all your wisdom that you've shared. Um, I'm gonna go off the script, because I sent them something on the email, but I haven't had a chance to see the show that was here at um, the De Young, and I just finally had a chance to see it today. So, and it's very colorful and amazing and the colors are really bright um and you know recognizing the fashion the rock and roll but i also just wanted to bring attention um on what was what else was happening during the time um alcatraz occupation probably one of the longest occupations of native folks here in san francisco was happening during the time um vietnam war and the resistance against that was also happening and the birth of um, Black Panther was approximately within that same time and wanting to acknowledge that because as I'm speaking here today and why I'm cultivating the craft that I have along with many other folks in the community is just kind of a direct connection. Started painting on the street, now I'm a muralist, doing legal, all those kinds of things. But the direct connection during the time was while you know, in the West Coast, Black like, Panther was happening, birth of hip hop was happening in the East Coast. And just want to say it's not accidental and that everything is connected, you know? And um, as far as being able to use the magic that Travis has been talking about, our magic, the youth magic, um, those is, is within the different art forms that we can cultivate. And that could mean a lot of different things. It doesn't mean you have to be a visual artist, or it doesn't mean that you have to sing like Beyonce, or it doesn't mean you have to dance like, you know, J-Lo or whatnot, but it means that um, just re really recognizing your own power, and really re recognizing your gifts and um, what it is that you can give to the world, you know? Because we don't live in, alone, we can't, survive alone and we have to kind of um, really recognize our place within it. What is it that we're receiving and that what is it that we can give back? So as far as the five points, I'm saying I'm going to go off the script because um, I was essentially going to talk about immigration um, and the points of immigration because it's such a hot topic right now um, with the executive order of, of like six countries being banned um, and especially the borders being, um, the, the wall being built, and that, you know, we already have like a crew of a bunch of visual artists ready to paint if that's, <laughs> that is actually going to be built up. But, but, um, but uh, seriously, um, I, and, and it's all connected. It's all connected. I mean, I wanted to kind of talk about that because of the state of the nation in which we're in right now is really intense and you know it's kind of triggering back a lot of different traumas that you know we're still dealing through. Um, I know that Bader has been talking a lot about you know um, the trauma that a lot of marginalized communities deal with but I think us as a society also deal with a collective trauma and that's constantly being triggered with the different things that's happening in the world right now. Um, and being able to deal and figure out how then can we as individuals also partake in the actual healing component of, of dealing, not only dealing with those trauma, but actually creating the world that we want to envision, that, that we envision, that we want to live in, you know? And I think that's kind of why I really got into this profession and doing the work that I do is that recognizing as artists, we have the power to create. And in, 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 in our case, um, myself and the people I paint with and the community that we partner with, um, we create images on the wall, you know, um, representing communities, representing their stories, representing their message. We consider ourselves um, visual translators of, of 
of the stories and the histories that are often untold. So my advice, and I'm gonna try to keep it simple, is um, I think for all of us to just keep creating, for all the poets that just came out here and showed us your talent, you know, keep keep writing, keep speaking, um, and, and get louder. <laughs> get louder, you know, because more than anything now is the time that the voices, our voices, um, should be heard. And I think too is this, um, Maybe another point, and I'm making this up, I'm just kind of freestyling now because um, I'm talking about something different because, you know, I just saw the show. <laughs> but the other one that I want to say is, is really kind of also, you know, comes through the power of being able to speak and being able to be heard is, is really getting to, like, taking the time to know and to learn. So talk to our elders, you know, talk, talk to the folks who, have path, um, paved the path for us and and really acknowledge the lessons so that we don't repeat the same mistakes, but also so that we can do things, um, we can see our progress um, in, in creating that other world that is possible. Um, because we've gone so far and I think, you know, we can only keep going further and upwards and onwards. Um, three, stay open. You know, really explore. Go out beyond the niche that you're comfortable with um, within within your school, within your neighborhood, within your community. Talk to other folks who might think differently than you do, I do, than we do. Because I think the more knowledge that we gain, the more outside, the more the better that we can create our own analysis of what it is that we're we're trying to create, what it is that we're trying to imagine, what it is that we're trying to make real. Um, and, and then be an ally. Just really kind of know how to support each other, how to hold each other, and how to, um, how, how to, how to create a world that, that each of us wants to be part of. So as an artist, you know, I'm creating it by colors and lines on the wall, but I think as people, we all have different gifts and different skills that we can share to actually make that imagination, whatever it is that we imagine, to be real. And if anything else, those are the only thing that actually ever started any change at all. So that's kind of my five points right here. All right, thank you, CC. That was wonderful, and thank you for being an adult in this um, community that supports teens, because we need more like you who are just around to share your words of wisdom and around to be a voice that is clear and strong like you have shared today. So our last panelist will be Yaro Slaps. Yaro Slaps is native to the Bay Area. Yaro paints portraits of people that most in society look down upon, and he paints them in a grace um, glorious and peaceful manner and strives to show the good side of people. His medium of choice is acrylics and occasionally gouache, spray paint, um, or watercolors. He likes to work on canvas, wood panels, foam, and anything that looks interesting. Yaro is curious and passionate and wants to share, the, um, share good vibes. Um, he knows his inspiration and reasons for painting will change and rotate like the planet we share. Hey. hey, how's everybody doing today? Doing good. Are you guys hyped up? Yeah. Yeah? All right, that's what's up. Um, so listening to all the panelists, like y'all uh, really brought a real diverse like message. And so I paint and I curate art shows and make music and just kind of like really in the SF Bay Area creative scene, so if any of y'all like paint or rap, like I have a brand called Swim, and we throw shows and we're always looking for young artists and creatives to like submit, and so I'm gonna I'm a keep it short and start with these like, these life tips I wrote for y'all, because growing up in the city, definitely been through a lot of different experiences, you know what I'm saying? Things can happen real fast. You gotta watch how you move. So the first one would be to keep positive people in your life who motivate you 
and help you progress. You don't always need to fit in. That can set you miles behind trying to keep up in the wrong race. So I just said that because high school, you know, everybody, you feel like you got to be a part of this or that, but really try to stay tuned with who you are and don't worry about what everybody else is like clicking up, trying to do, do what you got to do. The second one would be don't lose sight of your goals. Don't give up easily if it's not, if it's not working out for you like right away. And some of the best advice that I get from people is just don't stop, you know, because as soon as you stop something, your movement stops, people stop asking questions. They say, hey, you still do this, you still do that. And so it's kind of like a, a workout plan or something. If you, if you start it, you, you down 10 pounds, you're still going, and then you just fall off and it all comes back. So it's like, <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, just keep, keep at it and be consistent and don't, don't, don't give up. Um, my tip number three is be healthy <laughs> um, and be aware. Don't overindulge, you know what I'm saying? High school is a time where a lot of people are partying and don't, don't lose sight, you know what I'm saying? of uh, what you're trying to do. And so when you feel good mentally, your mind's clear, physically, your body feels good, and spiritually, you know what quest you're on, you can accomplish a lot more. So I feel like that's real important. And uh, my tip four is for like artists, is uh, study and creative, just everybody. Like study what's going on in your life and what's going on around you. We're obviously in a crazy time right now, so. You know, just keep studying, see what's going on, and put it into your work. Um, try new things and have fun, because once it becomes a job, you're gonna have a lot of responsibility with it. So it's like, when you're in high school, you could paint whatever you want, but once people start like buying your work, then it all changes. <laughs> it's not like, oh, let's just try this and try that, you know. Um, my tip five, I would say whatever field you're in, like really study that field. Um, if, you're, if you're an artist, look at artists from like the 1700s, 1600s. It's like art's been around for so long. That's why when I started rapping, I didn't, rap hasn't been around like as long as art. But so just study, study who does what you do because that's how you can effectively use your own voice search for information. The more you know, the better. Knowledge is power. I think y'all know that. So, uh, yeah, y'all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can start it off, all right? Okay, so, again, thank you all for being here. It was really amazing, and, you know, I think one of the most important things that we have to learn as teens is that we can trust the elders in our community because for some reason there's a lot of distrust among you know different age groups and I feel like just seeing all of you here really makes reminds me that I have people in this community to trust. So my question to you guys, if anybody wants to answer, free for all, is you know what different artists inspire you, especially since we're in a museum where we're showcasing art, you know. What artists or rappers or writers inspire you to be who you are right now and to be where you are right now? I'll take that on just because um, it's actually one of my teacher's birthday today. Um, and she, her name is Juan Alicia. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to get to know her name or get to know who she is, I would suggest just walk around the mission <laughs> and just see her work. Um, she's one of the um, seven women who painted the Women's Building on 17th and near Valencia. I don't know exactly what street, but she's also a teacher of mine, and I, I look up to her because you know she's not one of those like artists that I read about in, in the past. She's here living, and she's actually like could climb with the scaffolding mm -hmm. faster than we can. <laughs> so I'm like, yo, like, yo, <laughs> like it doesn't to do that, you know, and she's still doing it. And I think what I love about her is that she paints stories. She paints stories of the folks and people who sometimes don't always have the opportunity to tell their own stories. 
or sometimes through the stories that she is connected with and that she is part of. Um, but beyond that is that her work, she just keeps getting better. And so it makes us all, I mean, you know, I know y'all are teenagers, but sometimes people still consider us youngsters, you know what I mean, right? right? But we're like constantly like still running after <laughs> that, you know, just trying to get better. Um, and I, I get what you were saying, like sometimes within different generations, there's trust issues that is, that, that, that creates tension. And I think that it needs to be acknowledged for one thing, but also um, we also need to just figure out how to move beyond that because there's so much that we can learn from each other. Both as young people being able to teach us younger people <laughs> and the older people and whatnot um, because Knowledge is kind of, just like everything else, doesn't have borders. And it doesn't have like time limits. Like it's knowledge that we can keep learning and like sharing amongst each other and we each all have something we can share. Just one of the people that check her out while we see her. Thank you. If, if I can add, um, Harry Belafonte's uh, mentor is Paul Robeson. And I'm gonna mess up his quote but I'll try to paraphrase. He said, basically, artist is the radical voice of civilization. So for me, I may not have a particular artist name in mind, but community artists, muralists, like what you do, you know, uh, take the, the issues of today's time or of their particular time and bring it to life on a wall and it actually creates within us a consciousness of the issues that are happening today. And so, you know, when I think about that quote, it really tells us just how powerful artists are in our lives, in this world, because the artists can transform us, it can elevate us to the issues that exist from, from the youth. I mean, you know, you can see that and unconsciously develop an understanding of the issues of the time. You know, and so I like what you just shared earlier about going down, seeing the art display, and then connecting it to what was happening at the at that particular time. Because we can't forget that. You know, those the, the movement was taking place about love and all that real colorful, but there was also some trauma going on. You know, and, and that artist, that particular artwork has to also be shown for us to know that it wasn't always peaches and cream. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. So, now that I have kind of started off the question, does anybody else have one? Yeah. Okay. There you go. So, do you just want to say your name? Oh, um, yeah. Your age? Um, or, no, not age. Where you're from. Um, my name is Jesse. Um, I'm from, I'm a native from San Francisco, born and raised. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a question, but I got a comment to say to y'all. I have huge respect for all of y'all for what y'all doing. And I want to keep doing it because I'm an artist too, and I understand what y'all saying. And I li I've lived here long enough. I'm, I may be young, but I've lived here long enough to know what's up. I mean, people say youth are just just do whatever, but we doing something. And I want to give y'all credit because now I feel inspired to do keep doing my art and keep on doing my poetry because that's what I want to do. And I want to say thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Hi, I'm from San Francisco. Also, uh, I want to pursue something that isn't relatively something that is the norm. And I know a lot of you are like rappers and artists, something that isn't something that your parents might have envisioned for you in the future. How did you overcome what they wanted for you and then do what you wanted and then continue thriving in doing what you wanted? Artists. <laughs> I did what they wanted. <laughs> um, I actually, I just started practicing art like about 10 years ago. I mean, I've always drawn or whatever and painted what I can, but professionally, I've only started about doing it 10 years ago. I graduated with 
an environmental law degree, <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, but I think I, I, a little bit about myself that I guess I didn't have a chance to share. Um, I was born in the Philippines, raised in the village, um, and came out here when I was 12 to San Francisco, 30 years on the mission, um, and then moved around after that. But for Filipino immigrant parents, traditionally it's just like, you know, you're like a nurse, <laughs> or like just, you know, they really imagine something professional, especially for immigrant families, like they, we came all the way here for that American dream that to be an artist was not necessarily even like an option, per se. Um, but for me, I just kind of kept doing it. I was doing other things, but I just kind of kept doing it. And it was until after college that I actually started practicing it professionally, where, like, you know, the homies will actually pay for me to paint, <laughs> to paint on the wall, kind of stuff. And then I just started hanging around with folks who were who are actually doing it um, and just learning from them. So I've learned painting just kind of on the streets, um, hanging out with my folks. So I think that. Every parents and every family is a different situation, um, but I do have this one night that I remember my mother, um, it was like four o'clock in the morning, I'm still kind of like, can't go to sleep, whatever, and I was at, um, my parents stayed back home in the Philippines and I was visiting them. Um, so I just started drawing and painting and she just, um, she was waking up and was wondering why I'm still awake and and she just kind of came up to me and she's like, you really love doing this, right? And I'm like, yeah. And you know, my, my mother immigrated to the States, I had like three jobs, like a typical immigrant family story or whatnot. Um, and I just remember her saying that, you know, like some people spent their whole life never really knowing what they loved. And the fact that some of us have learned that earlier on, there, there's something about that and it's something to follow and, and I think like, it doesn't have to be one or everything, you know? We can do a lot of multiple things for multifaceted people. Um, but my life is a little different. So I'm just saying like, follow follow your, you just, just know what your love and follow it. And I think that this, and you'll figure out a different way to make it happen. Oh, I wanna to add to that. And also like, the unlearning thing, just be open to like maybe, and right now you think you want to be a biologist, but like in five years, you're like an artist all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. So like, just be open to the change because you'll always learn something from like going for it. Like when you give it your all, you're gonna learn things. You know? So give it your all. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an elder here. And you know, I can remember my father sharing, you know, go to school, go to college, get an education, but he never really identified specifically what I should do. But what I'm getting at is that, um, and Mr. Your brother just said it too, um, he would have never envisioned me becoming a system engineer, you know, dealing with computers, because they basically didn't exist in his day. You know what I'm saying? To give me that idea. And so uh, my heart took me there. But my heart also has taken me in a different direction based on the tragedy of what we experienced in 2009, on January 1st, when my nephew was murdered, where I have become much more knowledgeable of, of, of community activism and what that's all about. But also, I have a son. And I can remember me sharing with my son, and, and, and this is food for thought. I've always, when he was in school, uh, wait, Xavier, uh, Xavier, New Orleans, getting his BA, and he was telling me he was, he was considering teaching. I'm like, why teach? There's no money in it. You know, that was my initial thought. Why teach? There's no money in it. He said, that, that's what I feel in my heart. You know, I'm like, okay, so I just bagged out. He got his BA, then he went on and got his master's, and he's been teaching. And I'm like, CJ, we call each other CJ. CJ, father, he's CJ, son. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, I was like, why you want to, he said he wanted to go into the hood. Hear what I'm saying, he wanted to go into the hood to teach. I'm like, 
You want to go into the hood to teach? What kind of sense that makes? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you can become an instructor at Stanford or Cal Berkeley. Yeah, you know I mean, you have that skill, you know, that aptitude. He said, no, Dad, that's where the work is at. You hear what I'm saying? So we as parents will love what our children do if it's from their heart. So no matter what your decision is and what you choose to do in life, you see what I'm saying? If that's what makes you feel good, we fall in love with that. I love my son because he taught me something. You see what I'm saying? I was caught up in this system of getting a degree, being miseducated, and thinking that money was all else. You know what I'm saying? Made everything. But he says, no, it's much more than that. This is about building people, thinking about society. And sure enough, when Oscar was murdered, all that came to light. And it is. It's all about you, for me, to give you something that will help you live another day. And the hope to inspire you to want to work to do change. My wife just left with our grandson, but this is about him. This is not about us. Think about it. You know, many of you don't have children, but one day you will. You hear what I'm saying? It's really about them because your failure to stand up and represent these babies that's coming into this world will be your fault. You hear what I'm saying? It will be your fault. So whatever we do, let's make this society better for these children that are coming, for my grandbabies that are coming. That all kind of reminds me. I was um, I worked at a school for about five years at an elementary, and I loved it. It was probably the hardest thing I've ever done, probably the hardest thing I ever will do, uh, but I loved it, right? And um, from a very, very young age, I knew I'm like, okay, cool, I really like my teachers. That's who I want to be. But being at that school also made me really acknowledge and appreciate that learning happens outside of the classroom in a really, really beautiful way, right? So I think when we're when we're young, we don't always acknowledge that, or we think of our identities maybe through a career path or through whether we went to college or not, and um, not not always, you know, the most fruitful way to, to experience our lives, right? Um, when I was working at this uh, school, and I was working with kinder through fifth grade, I had, I had them all. Um, I just really, I, I remember thinking, I think we, someone asked a question like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And people were like, this and this and this. And I'm like, well, what about the teachers? And what about the community organizers? What, what is a community organizer, right? I, I struggle trying to explain that to my parents too. Like, well, I garden and I also work with you. And I go to all these marches and they're all family friendly. <laughs> so it, it is it is kind of this situation we, we I try to explain, but it is about passion and it's about love, and I feel very lucky to be able to like surround myself with with that because that's what keeps me going every single day, right? It's like, darn, like back to back meetings, but tomorrow I'm going to this march and it's going to be amazing, or tomorrow I'm going to see this farm come to life and it's going to be amazing. Um, maybe those aren't your passions, right? Maybe your passions are in engineering and in this and that, but just acknowledging that. Um, it's not always tied to what we graduated in or what we studied, right? Um, right? You, you studied environmental law, but you're in the environment, right? So you're enacting whatever you learned in a different way, and that's beautiful. Um, Inka, what are you interested in studying? Oh my god, that's such a hard question. <laughs> that's such a hard I have no idea what I'm going to do. Right? Yes, but no. you're learning, right? But I know that I love the environment and animals. That's, that's, that's it. That's all basically. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for um, sharing your questions and your comments. And let's all give a round of applause to our wonderful. <laughs> Out of the shadows. 
no longer aware of my feelings because society wants to fit them to the other's likings. I feel the pressure of the people in this world to judge every inch of my body. Your curves need to be slimmer, tighter, society shouts as the words float into my ears. I am a woman, or through society eyes, I am a servant to all men to clean, cook, and love every man that's in my life because that is what us women are taught. We are taught to love the opposite gender because otherwise we will bring shame upon our families. But I'm done following society's footsteps. I am deciding my own path and I will tear up all stereotypes that stand in my way and to try to define me. And I will love who I want to love because love should not be defined by gender but by, but by how you care, cherish, and love one another. I will face my fear and climb this ladder until I have reached my hope that everyone can take hands and form a circle that will be unbreakable by the hatred this world will throw at us. I am putting my foot down and taking the hand of equality and let it lead me and many others to a place where peace grows all around us, where the air, where the air smells, like, smells of comfort and acceptance. This is mine and many others beginning to meet equality face to face. They found me buried beneath the mineral-rich soil, dusted my edges like the wind blows sand, placed the ingots of my body in a cast of iron. It was there he shaped me, molded my form into, into the proportions he desired. I was destined to carry my weight in gold. He created leopard, the one who lays in the shade of the trees, waiting to pounce upon the herds of animals. Her golden eyes set their gaze on the bright savanna, watching the sun rise and set, and shadows dance and follow the moving glow. The man in the leather apron set me ablaze, and when he finished, I emerged not as an ingot beneath the mineral soil, but as the leopard, the one who lays in the shade of the trees. The man in the le leather apron lifted me to his chat lips. My little leopard, you have, you have yet to realize this, but the world does not deserve you. You carry the spirit of the leopard, and you are worth the weight of gold. I am the leopard, I exclaimed. It is I who hunt the herds of gazelles. I prowl the Serengeti. Yes, I am the leopard, who is w worth the weight of gold. They placed me on one side of the hollow brass scales. On the other side was go uh, gold, clumped and dense. As the scales balanced, the men laughed, shook hands, and lifted gold. And they did this again and again, comparing my greasy complexion with gold's radiant shine. Each time they lifted gold and left me teetering down on one sided scale. As gold hovered above me, shining in the light of the sun, he taunted and laughed at my expense. But each time he lifted, I am the one who carries his weight. I recalled the words the man whispered so long ago. My bronze sheen felt no rusted scars or oxidated rashes. The words felt warm in my chest. Deep in the dirt, six feet below, left here to let the ground shape me once more, it is here where I am free of the judgment and heartache. I move my bronze joints for the first time and walk into the golden glow of the setting sun, leaving behind the brass scale, the leopard spirit, and the weight of gold. to everyone for attending today. That was a really awesome poem. Can we all give a round of applause to all of our two artists? And um, of course, uh, thank you would not be complete without having our Teen Advisory Board members come on up to the stage too. So come on down. Say thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you. 
But um, yeah, from all of us at the bottom of our hearts, the depths of the sea, the heights of the heavens, we really want to say thank you for attending, participating, and everything you brought. So thank you so much, and we'll be having cool tattoos and more information on how to get that app that Uncle Bobby shared, because that's super empowering for everyone. And we all can unite, you can put it somewhere on your body. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say um, that we still have art making and conversation starters in the gallery, so join us. We're here till five o'clock, and see you again sometime at the museum. Teens are always free at the museum in our permanent collection, so come back, enjoy. This is owned by the city of San Francisco. Come back, it is yours. Make it a part of your life. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.